If you want to be glory, you want Jesus to be glorified in the house. How many of you want him to be glorified? We just need to let him know, Lord, we want you to be glorified. That is not about us. God, we decrease. We want you to increase. You are glorified in this place on tonight. Hallelujah. 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 We love you, Jesus. My God yes. is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. Come on and worship My him. My God is awesome. Yes, Lord. Heals me when I'm broken. Strength where we I've been weak and forever. Worship him. My God is awesome. 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 Yes, sir. Church. My God is awesome. He heals Bless me you. when I'm broke. Strength where I am weak. And I worship forever you. He will reign. Oh. My God is oh. awesome. Yes, He is awesome. He's awesome. Oh, I love you, Jesus. <laughs> Savior of the whole world, giver of salvation, by his stripes I am here. Come on, church. My God is awesome. He's awesome. Today I am forgiven. Yes, sir. His grace is why I'm living. Oh, yes, sir. Praise his holy name. Somebody ought to get excited. Awesome, yeah. He's awesome, awesome. He's awesome, awesome. We worship your He's God. Awesome. awesome, Come on, my God is awesome. We worship your Lord. Awesome, awesome. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Awesome. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
worship you. Worship you. Come on, clap your hands and give God some praise. Look at somebody, tell them what a mighty God we serve. We serve an awesome God. How many of you know it for yourself that he's awesome? How many of you know we're just not talking about something we heard about? Look at somebody say, I know he's awesome. Bless you. Put them hands together. Come on, let's have another church. Let the glory of the Lord yes, sir. rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord Whoa. rise among us. <laughs> Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh. Let it rise. Come on, church, put your hands together. Let the glory of the Lord. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, yes, sir. Up 
Let them hands together. Let's celebrate Jesus in the house. Amen. God is a good God. And he's worthy to be praised. Certainly want to welcome all of our streaming live audience on tonight. And I certainly appreciate each and every one of you which have pressed your way to be in the services of the Lord. As we continue to pray and fast and consecrate ourselves unto the Lord. As that we would do a special prayer for Brother Doug Hurston's daughter. Uh, who they had to earn lift uh, this evening uh, to Charleston. So let's continue to lift her up in prayer as well as my sister Phyllis. Amen. How many of you ready for the word of the Lord on tonight? God bless you. God bless you. If you're hungry, say, I'm hungry. And I don't want no peanut butter and jelly. Give me the word of the Lord. Stretch forth your right hand tonight. Say, Lord, you bless. Minister Crystal Carey. Prophetess Bandy. To teach the word. Preach the word. Teach it. Preach it. In Jesus' name. God bless you, minister. together for Jesus. Amen. On this evening, truly, this is an honor and a privilege just to be able to stand before you on tonight and minister the word of God. You have to listen closely. My voice is a little bit lacking, but I know God's going to bring everything that we need. Um, I'm not going to call names on tonight if you don't mind. I'm going to admit all of that, and we're just going to go right into the word of God. Um, I have a little ways to get down the road in a little short period of time. I promise my message isn't long, but I am going to take my time and deliver it the way God gave it to me. Amen. So if you would just wouldn't mind going to the book of Genesis, chapter number 19. And I ask that if you wouldn't mind standing to your feet for the reading of the word of God. I have two passages of scripture on tonight. And we're going to start in Genesis. Amen. And if you don't mind... My Bible may read a little bit different from yours. I'm reading from the new, the NIV version. But because you need to fact check us preachers sometime. If you wouldn't mind, would you mind reading with me, starting at the 15th verse. It's Genesis chapter 19, verse 15. I'm going to read all the way down to verse number 26. Amen. With the coming of the dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, please, your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life, but I cannot flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look here is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said unto him, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zor, which means small. By the time the lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down, burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of these heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. My focus for tonight will be verse number 26. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. If you would turn in the New Testament to me, t- with me to chapter 17 of Luke. Amen. Verse number 28 is where we're going to start and we're just going to stop at verse number 32. If you have it, just say, I got it, I got it. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It was just like this on the, it will be just like this on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, 
no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. If I had to choose a subject on today, it would be those last three words of that passage of scripture that Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. And if you'd allow me to have a subtopic or what I like to call a way to apply it to our lives, it would be run and never look back. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity, God, to stand before your people and to preach the word, God. For it sure is an honor and privilege that this vessel of clay, God, can get up and preach. And I ask right now that you will anoint these lips of clay so that I can deliver this word to your people in the manner that you gave it to me, and that they will get the revelation that you have given unto me. Lord, be my helper. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, in this particular passage of scripture, I just want to give you a little bit of a, a background on it before I start. It takes place in Bible days, of course, and I don't need to really tell you that it's in the Old Testament, so that means that was before Jesus Christ had been born on earth. Amen. And since um, it is in the book of Genesis, it was in the time of Abraham. And Abraham was a man who started out his life as Abram. Then when he was 99 years old, nearly 100, 90 and a half, sometime does do, 99 years old, God changed his name to Abraham and also gave him a promise. I urge you in your downtime to go to chapter 17 and study Abraham if you don't know the story because there's a lot of good meat in that particular part of the scripture. When you, whenever God gives someone a promise, it is perpetual, and it trickles on down to us, but a lot of times we don't know the promises that we have, so we don't even know to claim them, but that's not my assignment on tonight. My assignment on tonight is talking about his nephew, whose name was Lot, more specifically, his wife, who was simply called Lot's wife. Now, in this passage of scripture on verse number 15, we find out, and if you all don't mind, I walk a little bit when I preach, is that all right? I'm not too hard to track, am I? <laughs> Amen. In this particular passage of scripture, we meet Lot at a time when he is in a place that is despairably wicked. Sodom and Gomorrah had reached a level of wickedness and wretchedness to the point where God sought to destroy it. Words cannot describe to you the mess, mayhem, foolishness that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But if you look at our world today, you will see signs of the same very thing. Now, two angels arrived in this particular city, Sodom and Gomorrah, and they met Lot inside the gate. Now, when Lot saw them, he fell on his face before them and begged them to come to his house Amen. And eat and, cl and clean up themselves. And he said, and then in the morning, you can proceed. Now, there has to be something right there about those men of God that Lot would already recognize there's something about them. And I need to get them to my house instead of allowing them to fall in the perils of this city. Now, at first, the angels insisted upon, no, we'll stay in the square. But Lot begged them so much, and he fell down on his knees and asked them until they conceded, and they went into his house. And when they went into his house they ate unleavened bread and they were getting ready to rest for the night and then Sodom and Gomorrah showed up at the door all the men come and they start banging and banging and banging and banging on Lot's door now Lot knew the kind of people that lived in Sodom and Gomorrah so he goes outside of his house and he shuts the door behind him, and he attempts to reason with unreasonable people. That's my first revelation on tonight. It is impossible to reason with unreasonable people. There is no reasoning in an unreasonable person, hence the name unreasonable. Now, in order for me to just really, really paint the picture of how despairably wicked Sodom and Gomorrah was. The men had come to Lot's house because they heard there were some strangers in town. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to get the men and take them out, ravage them, and rape them. And Lot is pleading with them, no, don't do this thing. Don't do this thing. These are visitors in my house. They were an incorrigible 
bunch. How many people in the house know on tonight that when your fleshly passions run out of control, wickedness will always be the result? That is the reason why God tells us to crucify our flesh. In Sodom and Gomorrah, the crime rate was up. They were sexually immoral. They were spiritually immoral. If I had to use a term, it was an all holes barred society. There was nothing. There was no rule. There was no order. They were takers. And they were willing to take whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and however they wanted. So, Lot tries to reason with them, and he makes a bargain that, again, is unfathomable. He said, I have two daughters who are virgins. Take them. I'll send them out here to you. Do with them what you will, but do not do to these men any harm. My first point was it's impossible to reason with unreasonable people. So they say, we will do this and worse to you if you do not hand them over to us. How many people have ever had their back up against the wall before? I have. In this particular scripture, Lot is pressed up against his door, and this angry mob of sinful, wicked men are pushing him to the point where they're going to break down the door. But the men on the inside were no ordinary men. So they open the door, and they reach, and they pull Lot inside, and they shut the door, and immediately all of the men who sought to destroy them were blind. Now not only could they not find the men, they can't find the door to bust it down. So then is when the angels reveal unto Lot their purpose for being in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's important to notice that Lot had already invited them into his home before he knew the purpose of them being there. They were there to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Good news for Lot is they had been sent there to rescue him and his family and then to destroy the city. Now, they asked Lot a question. Do you have any sons, sons-in-laws, or any other people in your family that belong to you? Revelation number two. Do not think that you can handle God's people or their people any kind of way. It is time for us to stop picking with God's people and picking with those that they love and picking with their children because see something that is attached to something that belongs to God is God's now he did not see anyone else in the house except for the two daughters that he was willing to sacrifice but he says if there's anybody else attached to you tell them to leave the city because or they will be destroyed as well so Lot went to his sons-in-law now this right here I've heard this story before, I had, but I always thought Lot only had the two daughters. But if you notice, in order to have sons-in-law, he would have to have daughters that were married. The two daughters that were in the house were virgins, so that would imply that they had not yet been. Right, so he had some sons-in-law, so that means Lot had some other daughters somewhere. But when he went to them and they told him with most urgency, you have to get out of the city, they laughed at him and they thought it was a joke. People of God, when God tells you to do something and people laugh at you, don't get discouraged. Your way of escape has already been paid. It's them that will peril. Amen. So, in verse number 16, it tells you that even though these men came, Lot was still hesitant. We can't be too hard on Brother Lot. I would be willing to bet if I told anyone in here tonight, don't go home to your house. Don't take anything with you. Leave. You would be a little bit skeptical. Amen? And then there's always that humanistic part of us that fears nothing. 
leaving with nothing, all the things that I've worked for and I have and I have to leave all these things behind caused him to be hesitant. His wife was hesitant. The daughters were hesitant. But the angels then grabbed them by the hands and led them out of the city anyway. My next revelation, all that the angels give us an example of how you carry out an assignment from God. They went in to retrieve Lot and his family. Their assignment was to retrieve Lot and his family. Leaving them was not an option. So they were willing to take their own hands and pull them out and take them city physically. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we took that approach with people who are lost? Losing you, my friend, is not an option. Leaving you here in this place of destruction is not an option. So I'm willing to reach down with my hands and I'm willing to pull you and lead you to a place of safety because that's what God has given me to do. Don't take assignments from God lightly. That is an example of why. So when they get them out in the city, they give them specific instructions. Flee for your life. When someone tells you to flee, that means hurry. Run as if your very existence depended on it. Don't walk. Don't dawdle. Don't waste any time. Flee for your life. And the second thing is don't look back. Don't look back. Have you ever tried to run forward looking backwards? If you're in a wide open field, you might could run for a while. But eventually, something is going to trip you up. So he said, do not look back. Now, Lot has a question on the motion. Isn't that us? If someone tells you, run for your life, don't look back. Don't even stop at the plane. When you think you get far enough, keep running. Don't stop there. Go to the mountain. There you know that you will be safe. Lot has a question. Please, not the mountains. See, a mountain is a place that's uncultivated. It's just trees on a mountain. He wanted to be able to have somewhere to build on without doing all the work. Revelation number two, and ministers, I'm going to meddle a little bit, but I love you, and I promise you, it hits me first. A lot of times, us as ministers, we look at Bishop's job as being easy. He, he took the mountain, and now that everything is already done, the blood, sweat, and tears is put into the ministry, we come in with all our bright ideas and our things to do and our way, but we forget that starting off on a mountain where there is nothing, building a ministry from the ground up where there is nothing, it's very hard. It's easy to sit in your seat and scrutinize his. But oh, if you put out, took off those, what are those, 10 and a half shoes? <laughs> Amen. It's a different thing. And that was Lot's very, very decision right there. He wanted to go to Zor. And he even reasoned with them and said, well, it's still small, but it's incorporated. It's small. But it's a city. It's small, but there are vendors there. It's small, but there are other people there. So the angel said, they granted his request, but whatever you do, Lot, go quickly because I can't do anything until you get there. Again, the assignment was so great that they couldn't even take a chance on setting it off before Lot and his family were safe. Now, we go on down the, the scriptures, and they start their descent into Zor. And have you ever been in a situation where you're going through the motions of a thing, but your heart isn't in it? You even see yourself moving, but you don't have a specific destination. That was the problem with Lot's wife. She had not yet released herself 
from her old life. And when she went through the motions of leaving, she was reluctant. And I'm sure she warred with herself and she did the horrible thing of doing what the angel told her not to do. She took her eyes off the destination of Zor and she looked back at the devastation that God had delivered them from. And instantly she became a pillar of salt, which are tiny, tiny granules of sodium chloride that is worth nothing. And then she becomes a testament to us in Luke chapter 17 of what not to do and how not to be when Jesus comes back. Isn't it funny how her name isn't mentioned? We as women now, we don't even like to take fully the last name. We like to take our maiden name, hyphenate it, and then I'll take your name. They didn't even give us her first name. They don't tell us who her mother was, who her father was. They tell us nothing about her. She is simply Mrs. Lot. Yet she holds such a particular place in history that her story is retold by Jesus himself to his disciples to teach them a lesson. Nameless wife, but she is a testament of what not to do. Luke is the coming of the kingdom, and what Jesus is teaching his disciples is that when Jesus returns, there will not be time for you to get it right. There won't be time for you to send up no timbers. There won't be time for you to pray. You're not going to be able to make it to the heart of God altar call. When he comes back, it is what it is. You are going where you're going. It is done. And he's using Lot's wife here and the story of Lot to illustrate to us that just like on the day of Lot, the people were drinking and eating and having a good time all in their flesh. Does that not sound like the world today? We are doing all the things that we want to do and we have forgotten all about God. We have forgotten that sin has consequences. The things that you do, you have to reap them back. We are playing with a very, very time-sensitive thing. If the Lord came back on tonight, you would not have time to go home and get your kids. You would not have time to call family members and warn them and try to pray them through. You would not have time for that because once Jesus comes, you can be on the rooftop. And the Bible says you cannot go and retrieve any of your goods. And then it tells us, Jesus reminds us to remember Lot's wife. Now, very quickly, I'm going to give you the three points that God gave me. Very quickly, I'm almost done, Sister Joy. Almost done. The three things about Lot's wife. There's so much that can, we can remember about Lot's wife. But the three things that God gave me was, first of all, remember her life and her lifestyle. The problem with what Lot's wife was, in the beginning, they were living outside of the city. When you live on the outskirts of a city, I've learned, I've done it. You get all the benefits of being near the city, but you don't have to deal with the problems that are in the city. You can go, you can barter, you can trade, you can shop, ladies, but you don't have to deal with the crime, your property value going down. You don't have to deal with that. And once they were in a tent, it was a more humble existence. But when they traded that tent in, for that townhouse in Sodom and Gomorrah, we have now arrived. We are no longer nomads. We own property. We have a home. We have things. They had to have been revered by those people because if you notice, they didn't ravage them. Until the visitors came, hell hadn't been to Lot's house. 
He had daughters that were virgins, so that tells you the men hadn't been there before. So they had arrived, and Mrs. Lot got very comfortable in her lifestyle. Is that not us? Let's not be too hard on her. We really love indoor plumbing. We really, really love to be able to flick a switch, not strike a match, and have light. If a storm comes through and something goes wrong and you don't have power at your house, you think it's the end of the world. Young people, I'm going to come down your street right now. Imagine a time when there was no Wi-Fi. You think the world is about to end if that Wi-Fi code does not work on your iPad. There were no iPhones. There were no iPads. There was no cable TV. So just because she had gotten more comfortable in a home than a tent, let's not frown on her too much. But she got caught up in the things, and her heart became tied to a place that was wicked. Lot was a righteous man. Peter tells us that. He was a righteous man. It does not tell us that his wife was not righteous. But by her looking back, we know that she had a soul tie to that place. She could have equated the success and all the things that they had with their move to Sodom. We do it. If I had never moved away, I wouldn't have all the things that I have. So you mean God operates differently and different zip codes? The devil is a liar. Sometimes instead of making God our first choice, we make him our last resort. And that was her biggest issue. God came to you in the form of two men to save you from being burned alive. And you still wanted to be there. You still wanted something back there in all that wickedness that you had. God forbid. Moving along. The second thing to remember is her sin. But what was her sin? What was her sin? Her sin was not the actual physical act of turning your neck and focusing your eyes behind you. If that was so, every time we go somewhere and you look back, you would be a pillar of salt. That's not the sin. The sin is in the disobedience. Mrs. Lot heard clearly what the angels told her to do. She heard it, she understood it, and she knew it. The angels did not mince words. They didn't speak in a different language. She understood the words, do not look back. Yet inside her was this longing that caused her to just have one more look. I got to just have one more look at what I left. One more look at what I lost. That's not foreign to us. You want to know how I know? Because Jesus came and he died for our sins. We know it. We understand it. We even claim to believe it. We've heard it. Yet that one thing that we love to do, that one person that we love so much we can't live without. That one thing, it could be your ego. It could be your job. It could be your bank account. It could be your spouse. It could be your not yet spouse. God help. What is, uh, now I'm going to say help Jesus. Anything in your life that means more to you than God. And the way he is outlined for you to live is a problem and it was that one thing that caused her to disobey God I would love to believe that if God came to rescue me out of a situation that I would have the good common sense to say thank you and move on but I know I'm not the only one in the house today that's had soul ties on something that wasn't good for me I know I'm not we all have had something that we have fooled with, carried, married, talked to, ingested, touched, taste, or tangled with that is out of the will of God.
And when that becomes a problem is when God sent you, Jesus, to deliver you. Yet we do not reach for Jesus. We turn our head and we look back. Why? Could you imagine how Jesus must feel? He didn't come down here in theory. He came down here in the same flesh that we have. He felt everything that you feel. He had every pain that we felt. He was brutally beaten, scorned, spit on, killed for us. Yet we still look back at devastation. Luke 9, 6 tells us that no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. That is why Jesus uses Lot's wife as an example of what not to do. Once you put your hand to the plow and you say, Lord, I am your servant. Use me, Lord. You can sing it. You can say it. You can preach it. You can testify it. But once you grab that plow, there's no looking back if you do you are not fit for the kingdom and you will be the one that when Jesus comes back you do not make the cut last one remember her fate you have to remember the consequence of her disobedience in order to really understand why you can't look back her, her disobedience cost her her very life it cost her her deliverance. It cost her everything that she had. And it was all because she chose to look back. For the wages of sin is, and that is non-negotiable. Don't ever think that because you do something wrong and you don't die, that that's not a problem. Remember that Jesus I just talked about? He came and died for our sins, and that puts us in his blood between judgment. But don't ever think that God is sleeping on your situation. Don't ever think that you can play jack rocks with the devil and then turn around and play patty cake with Jesus. The devil is a lie. God is not a man that he should lie. And when he tells you that there are consequences for your sin, there is. I urge you in 2016, and I'm almost done, to use this time of consecration for what it's intended to be. Don't use it as a diet. Fasting is not dieting. Don't use it as some kind of a way to brag about how strong you are spiritually. Fasting is supposed to get you out of your flesh, so that right there, you might as well eat. Don't use it to brag to people, well, you know I'm fasting because now you're in your flesh. The Bible teaches us that when you are fasting, no one is even supposed to be able to tell that you are fasting. Use it as a time to consecrate yourself, to find whatever that is in your life that's not like God, that could hold you accountable if Jesus came back. Look in your heart and see what Sodom and Gomorrah still lies in your heart. Don't think because you have a title or you have a call or you have a collar or you have a robe or you have a Bible or you have a good bank account that there isn't something that Sodom and Gomorrah could be in. Why? Because you are a spiritual being, but you are encased in flesh. And the devil tries us at all points and times. And sometimes wouldn't it be sad to be almost there? Lot's wife was almost safe. She was almost rescued. She was almost delivered. But almost don't count. It would be sad to stand before God and find out that you were almost saved. You was almost in his will. You almost made it in. You almost had it. Almost won't count. The, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And this is my last point. I'm going to mark my conclusion. I'm going to wrap it up. And it's sad that in the house of God, we eliminate the middleman. We do his job for him. There are people out in the world who are dying. 
And we come in God's house and we fuss and argue over seats, over positions, over tasks, over solos, over rotations. And the devil sits back and he laughs at us because, wow, y'all making my work easy. I don't have to destroy them. They destroying themselves. Oh, ye cannibals who would come in and destroy your own. Do you not appear to be just like the men of Sodom and Gomorrah who came to Lot's house and started banging on the door to ravage God's people? You better watch out because you, you got to understand fire and brimstone rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed everything. Not just the people that did it. It took the property, the vegetation. Can anything even ever grow there again? So I urge you, take 2016 as the year of love and love somebody. Love them for real. Love them until it hurts. Love them the way that Jesus loved me. Love him so much that you fail and it's not an option. If I had to come in and help you push the plow, I'll help you push the plow. But you going back is not an option. If I had to put my arms on your shoulder and walk with you and constantly remind you, uh-uh, baby, don't look back. We're getting ready to get delivered. Don't look back. we almost safe. Come on, if that's what it takes, then show the love of God to somebody. Because if you show the love of God to somebody, you will find out that this existence will be a whole lot easier. Don't just tell me you love me. Show me you love me. Don't let it be a, a, a salutation or a farewell. I love you. I love you too. No, not just words. Mean it from your heart. Show me love. If you see me tripping, come and talk to me. Don't pass judgment on me. Come and help me up. If you see me fall, reach down with your hands and help me up. Don't beat me up with your mouth. Don't send somebody else. Show me some love so that I won't have the same fate and it won't be, remember, Lot's wife. And in my conclusion on tonight, I just want to tell anyone into our streaming live audience, anything that's going on in your life, Jesus is the answer. He's the answer. Because he is it. If you need anything, anything, he is Jehovah Jireh. That means the Lord who provides. Just as God provided a sacrifice for Abraham and spared his son, will he not do the same for you? Philippians 4 and 19 says, but God shall provide all of your needs according to his riches and glory. So what you worried about? Bad news should not affect you. Whatever man says they're going to take from you, God is it. If you have God, you have it. If you're sick, he is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who heals. Sometimes we go to doctors and we think the healing is in them. Oh, no, no, no. All healing comes from God. So what you worried about? You get a bad report from the doctor. Whose report are you going to believe? We're going to believe the word of the Lord. If you're warring right now with something that's bigger than you, God is our Jehovah Nisi. He's our banner. What does the banner represent? It's not a price tag. It's not a sign. It's victory. You can overcome anything in your life when God is your victory. Now, right now in the midst of your situation, whatever it is, I don't need to know what it is, I encourage you and I implore you to try Jesus. Scriptures tell you everything that it is, but you're looking at a living witness of what God can do. I don't mind telling you, I was a wretch. I was a mess, but God saw fit to save me. God can take a mess and turn it into a messenger.
So on tonight, I implore you to remember Lot's wife. And when you put your hand to the plow, run and don't ever look back. God bless you. Praise the Lord, church. What an awesome word. Hallelujah. The first time I've heard Sister Crystal preach since she stepped forth into the ministry, and I just want to say that was an awesome word. Hallelujah. Continue to let God use you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, I'm going to go right into my message tonight. Hallelujah. I'm not going to detain you. Giving honor to all giving on to the pastor of this house. Hallelujah. I'm just going to ask you to stand tonight for the reading of God's word. Hallelujah. I'm going to be coming to you out of 2 Chronicles, the 7th chapter. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and Romans, the 12th chapter. If you have 2 Chronicles, would you say amen? Hallelujah. I'm going to be reading the first through the fifth verse. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good and his mercy endureth forever. The king and all the people offered the sacrifices before the Lord. And the king Solomon offered a sacrifice of 20 and 2,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. 1 Corinthians 6, do you have it? Say amen. Hallelujah. What? That's a question, church. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Romans 12, hallelujah, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, we come to you tonight, Lord, asking, Lord, that you would be with us here in the midst of this service as you've already been, Lord. Father God, that you would anoint your servant, Lord, to speak your word. Father God, speak it with clarity and with boldness, Lord. Father, we'll ever give you the praise, Lord. We'll ever give you the honor. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, church. If I was to give my message a title tonight, it would be Dedicating and Consecrating Our Temples. If I was to give it a subtitle, it would be There Will Be Glory After This. <clears throat> Excuse me. Church, when I sought the Lord concerning what I was to speak to you about tonight here, he gave me two words. He dropped two words into my spirit. The first being sacrifice. And the second being glory. Hallelujah. The second being glory. He spoke to me that we as the body of Christ will be asked to make great sacrifices in this year, 2016. But the glory that follows will be greater still. And I said, Lord, you know this year, 2016, is said to be representative of love. And he asked me, 
What was the greatest love ever shown? It was that sacrificial love of Jesus there on that cross of Calvary. But he said, you already know how much I love you, what I sacrificed for you. He said, now it's time, church, for you to show me some love. Show me some sacrificial love. Hallelujah. I looked up the word sacrifice, church, and some of the definitions I found were to give up to let go, hallelujah, and to surrender, to give up something, the act of giving up something for some higher advantage or dearer object. Anybody looking for something higher and dearer, hallelujah. The Lord told me that sacrifice is a word that has become foreign to the body of Christ, and we don't want to give up let go or surrender anything, yet we still expect God to do what only can be brought about by sacrificing the evil for the good and the good for the greater. We don't want to let go of some things that are hindering us in our walk with God, in our relationship with God. We want to hold on to God with one hand and the world with the other church. Hallelujah. We need to let go go and let God hallelujah remember what Jesus hallelujah told the disciples when they couldn't cast out the demon from the demon possessed boy hallelujah he said this kind hallelujah go if not out but by prayer and fasting in other words church Jesus was telling them he said Boys, you got to make a greater sacrifice. If you want to work the works you've seen me work here today, you're going to have to pray and you're going to have to fast. Hallelujah. You're going to have to do some greater sacrifice. And hallelujah. And then the Lord reminded me of the great sacrifice that Solomon and the people made when they dedicated the temple. I believe it said they sacrificed 22. 2,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep with one of the greatest animal sacrifices ever made in the Bible. But what amazed me, church, hallelujah, what set me on fire, hallelujah, was the fact that the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house and the priest could not minister or even enter into the house it also said they could not stand because the glory was in the house church when the glory is in the house hallelujah we won't be able to stand under the anointing because the head glory is heavy it's weighty hallelujah and we won't be able to stand and when the glory came down hallelujah the people began to worship and praise God they didn't need a man to pump them up because the priests were laying out they couldn't stand either hallelujah it was just a spontaneous praise and the worship that broke forth when the people saw the glory in the house hallelujah I've seen that glory in this house church I've seen it but it's just hovers over us hallelujah it's just hovering there sometimes I've seen it come very close hallelujah but it doesn't come down hallelujah what I'm longing for church hallelujah is to see the house filled with the glory of God hallelujah I'm longing to see it church hallelujah I'm longing to see God fill his house with his glory and as I was looking at how Solomon and the people dedicated their temple unto God. It was the prayer, hallelujah, and the sacrifices that brought the glory down, hallelujah, and filled the house. So church, if the prayers and the sacrifices, hallelujah, that Solomon and his people gave forth, hallelujah, brought the glory, won't it do the same for us? Hallelujah, church, hallelujah. No, I'm not saying we need to make some animals.
animal sacrifices because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Hallelujah. There need not be no more animal sacrifices, but God is asking us, church, the body of Christ, to make some sacrifices. Hallelujah. God is asking us, hallelujah, to sacrifice some stuff. Hallelujah, to lay down some stuff, to give up some stuff. Hallelujah. But God is asking us, hallelujah, to present our bodies, hallelujah, as a living sacrifice. He reminded me that our bodies are the temple, hallelujah, of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. And the Holy Ghost is Jesus in you. And Jesus in you, hallelujah, is the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren. I plead with you. Hallelujah. Present your bodies. Hallelujah. A living sacrifice. Hallelujah. Present it. Hallelujah. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and then he goes on to say don't be conformed to this world hallelujah but be transformed by the renewing of your mind hallelujah that ye may prove hallelujah what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God God wants us to prove it church he wants us to prove his good acceptable and perfect will Hallelujah. And I began to say, okay, God, I see what you're saying. You're not wanting any more dead sacrifices of goats and sheep. Hallelujah. But you want a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, an acceptable sacrifice, which is our bodies, the whole trichotomy of man, spirit, soul, and body. And we just can't give you these bodies any kind of old way. We must be willing to give up. Hallelujah. Let go and surrender some things in our lives. Making the sacrifice. Giving up. Hallelujah. Whatever God is telling you to give up. Hallelujah. Whatever is hindering you in your relationship with God. Whatever is keeping us from the glory of God. I truly believe church. Hallelujah. I believe this. That the next great move of God will be his glory glory his glory in the church hallelujah god is gonna move in the church in such a way hallelujah that, that we are not gonna be able to understand even what's going on hallelujah but it's gonna cost us something church we're gonna have to give up some things David said, hallelujah, he refused to offer unto God something that cost him nothing. Hallelujah. So I asked you tonight, church, are you willing? Hallelujah. Are you willing to pay the cost? Hallelujah. Are you willing to make the sacrifice to prove, to prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? Unto him be glory in the church. Hallelujah. There we will hallelujah there will be glory after this oh glory to your name church god hallelujah no church this year 2016 won't be an easy year but it will be a year that we will see the glory of god as never before if we be willing hallelujah to let go of give up and surrender all to God. Whatever God is asking you to let go of, let go of it, church. Let go of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. And we will see the glory of God in the house. Paul said, I reckon, I reckon, church, hallelujah, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us, church. Hallelujah. We are the church. Hallelujah. There is a glorious liberty coming into the body of Christ. Hallelujah. When we decide 
God that we are aiming for what we are aiming for is much better than what we have when we press into the glory when we present our bodies as living sacrifices hallelujah holy holy I said holy church God wants holiness for his body hallelujah he said be holy hallelujah even as I am holy when we decide that these bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost and we 